Hello, my name is Sue Byron and I play violin or viola with the Issaquah Philharmonic Orchestra and I am also currently serving as the board president. You will notice that I am wearing a mask. Currently, we're in the midst of a worldwide pandemic and since I am not yet fully vaccinated and I want to be sure I'm protecting the person that I'm interviewing today, I will be wearing a mask. I will be speaking today with Frances Walton, who is 93. Frances has spent a lifetime helping people learn, perform, and enjoy music. I also want to take a moment to thank the two high school students that are helping us get this interview done, and that's Giovanni and Bella, who are both students at Issaquah High. Frances is a Washington legend and Issaquah treasure. At the age of three, she began on the piano. At the age of 16, she won a scholarship to the prestigious Tanglewood, where she met Leonard Bernstein. And we'll find out more about that a little bit later. While raising three children in Issaquah, Frances managed to start what is now the Bellevue Youth Symphony, the string program in the Issaquah School District, the Olympic Music Camp, the Philharmonia Northwest, and also through the Ladies um, Music Club of Seattle, founded a prize for young professional musicians that takes them out to perform classical music in underserved communities, which is now named in her honor, the Frances Walton Award. At 90, Frances became active in the Issaquah Philharmonic Orchestra and performed the first movement of the Elgar Cello Concerto with the orchestra. Frances has also received the highest civic honor of the city of Issaquah and is a member of the Issaquah Hall of Fame. It is my great privilege and pleasure to interview Frances Walton for you today. Fran, I really want to thank you for making time to talk with me today. I deeply appreciate this. To you, Sue, Giovanni, Bella, thank you very much. I just would like to start off with how we met, because it's one of my most cherished memories. <laughs> yeah. So I get my haircut at Markel's down on Front Street, and I'm always inviting Markel and Luba to come to the Issaquah Philharmonic Orchestra concerts. Yeah. And Luba was always telling me, you need to meet Francis. Frances is a great lady and she plays the cello. And I would always say, I would love to meet Frances and she should come be part of the orchestra. Yeah, right. And uh, at that time, I was serving as the secretary for the orchestra, so it was my job to check the email. And then one day out of the blue, there was your email saying, I'd like to come check out the orchestra. And I was so excited when you came to meet you. And the amazing thing to me was when you walked in the door, three of our members had all been students of yours at some point in one of your groups. Most everyone has. It was amazing. So I thought that was really fun. And I would just like to start off with you telling us how you got started in music. I understand you were an early pianist. Yes, my mom played piano all the time and sang. She didn't have a great voice, but it was honest and full-throated. But the most amazing part was that she never read music. She just played. And it was harmonically so complete and so rich that that was the way I grew up. So it was a wonderful way to know how to play. I never read a note. We neither one of us did. We just played. Wow. And I couldn't reach the pedals. Gee, don't worry about the pedal work. That'll come later. So you started off with the piano. Yes. And it's my understanding that that's what took you to Tanglewood on scholarship? Yes. Uh, my mom belonged to what was called the Tacoma Women's Study Club. And each year they concentrated on some element in the arts, like literature and poetry or sculpture and art. This year was music. 
So I auditioned, and I won the audition on piano, and I was sent back to Tanglewood. And when you get there, if you're a young person, and I was 16, so I was still in the pre-college program, you have to take another instrument. And I thought, oh boy, here's my chance to play the cello. I always had wanted to, and I'd played a little bit in high school whenever an instrument was left over and didn't get included in the inventory. I got that instrument. So I had had a cello for three months, but that was it. But I made the most of that. Still, when I got in the line, I could hear the orchestra rehearsing in the barn because the big concert hall at Tanglewood had not been built in. And by golly, I was, I was standing there and somebody gave me a baton and they said, you're next. I said, what are we doing? He said, Grieg's Piano Concerto. Well, I said, I've, I've played it. He said, good thing. And he put that one in and there I was. I was supposed to be conducting the, the last movement. So if I understand this, you got in line to get a cello and you wound up becoming the, a conducting student of Leonard Bernstein. Yes, I finally was accepted because I could, did a couple of things right that no one had done right. But I played the concerto so I knew what to do. I mean, I just let my baton follow the music. So you wound up in Washington and it's my understanding that you wanted to continue your education as a conductor and there was some professor of conducting at UW? Yes, Dr. Stanley Chapel. Okay. He was exceptional. Uh, I took all his classes and he said, Francis, I do not approve of a woman conductor professionally. I said, Stanley, I don't want to conduct professionally. I want to be a really solid amateur. I want to know that I'm doing the right thing, that I'm making the right motions, that they have meaning to the orchestra. He said, Francis, if you're not going to accept that professionally, I can allow you a master's degree. And he did. So I want to come uh, and loop it down to Issaquah at this point, because I remember you telling me that you were friends with Julius Bohm? Yes. And that you and Julius hatched a plot involving chocolate to inspire young people to join the orchestra. Well, so he came every rehearsal when we started the Youth Symphony, and we started in the Issaquah Junior High School. And thank God for the Issaquah School District. I think Clifford Cliff Johnson was the superintendent at the time. And he gave me ample opportunity to just sit, sit in the junior high school, bring all the kids in, and they came from all over the east side, from Renton through Issaquah, Bellevue, Mercer Island, Ken, Kenmore, Kenmore, and you know, all the way up into Woodenville. And they just came. There were almost 200 of them. And I loved every one of them. And we finally established three levels. Julius always came with his broken chocolates because the, even the woodwind players, they saved their chocolates till after the rehearsal. But boy, they went home on a chocolate high. No one, if their parents, I think, thought they were high on music. It was Julius's chocolates. He was wonderful, Julius was. A good musician. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the groups that you founded during your time in Washington? Yeah. It actually started with, there wasn't a, a symphony orchestra or anything, any music for kids in the Mercer Island School District. So I started what we called that time, the Mercer Island Little Symphony. And that group, uh, they did very, very well. We did our first concert, we did Mozart 40th Symphony, and it was just really wonderful. We had a pianist, a clarinet, a cellist, four violins. You know, we were really a motley crew, but we, we did things. And when I, Stanley gave me my master's, I also earned my teaching certificate. So I went out to Issaquah because Roger wanted to, 
Well, I'll tell you, we found out that our children, when I was going to school, I came home an hour later than they did, and they were running through the, the Mercer Island School uh, down, downtown. And I thought, gee, that's not what you always hoped your children would always do. And so we decided to look further afield. And Roger found this home up on Tiger Mountain, and we moved in in 1964. And we were the only residents that still are the only people who've lived here in this house. And it's just been lovely. You know, things kind of evolve and come to you through the wonderful people. It's people in this world that matter. And I've just met them all through music. You also uh, founded a music camp. Yeah. Well, it was during the the school year, all these kids came. There was no television at the time. So I was television. <laughs> and they came just from everywhere, and they had a marvelous time. And we played some Mozart and some Haydn, but mostly we played Beethoven, starting with Beethoven one, three, four, five, six, eight, and nine. We skipped second. And number seven, don't ask me how it happened. But those kids, Beethoven is wonderful. He works at any tempo. So if you play Beethoven slowly, you find out things you never would find if you heard it played as fast as many of the professional players now take it. And that wonder of Beethoven is something that just filled those kids. Of course, we went on to play Stravinsky, Dvorak, many, many, Barber, American composers, Barber and Hovannis, but they really got their teeth honed on Beethoven. Well, as he's you the know, man. I'm, he's the, he, I'm very fond of Beethoven. Yeah, he's the man. He really is. And that was the Olympic music camp? Well, it became the Olympic music camp because we became the Olympic Youth Symphony. And we auditioned once, and then you sent in your tape, and this was to the International Festival of Youth Orchestras. So the first time we auditioned, we didn't get in. But the second time, we did. And the third time, we did. And this was the group you took on tour then? Yes. And we took, we went to, we went to Kirk, Kirk and Tillich, Scotland, to Aberdeen, Scotland, and then I finally took them on to another story, but I took them on to Norway. And they went to all the Norwegian places that I had been. Michael Sharmatiev wanted to take it, and it was his job, but he had a heart attack. So he said, Fran, if you can just come and take my place. So you were the sub? I was the sub. I was his. And so he knew I didn't want the job. My home was here. But so I went, I thought I'd be there for one month. That was what he said. But he didn't know how ill he was. So I ended up being there for six months. And that was quite an introduction. And we, we played Carmen in Italy. And the Italians came because it was so funny. Here we were, an American orchestra with an American conductor and a French story and a Spanish, you know, background to Carmen, and the Italians knew that opera by heart. But by golly, here was it being sung for them in Norwegian. They had never, ever seen anything so <laughs> funny in their life. Meanwhile, I just stuck to the music because that was all I could hang on to, you know, because I didn't understand Norwegian either, so. I just conducted the, the music, and it's a wonderful score, Carmen. You also founded the Philharmonia Northwest, isn't that correct? Well, yes. Uh, we had in, in the Thalia Symphony, which is another branch. I joined Thalia because they had a library, and it was quite a full library. Michael Cernamedia had invested a lot of his money and other people's money in that library, and I really needed music. And these kids were hungry. I mean, they ate music. It was just, they loved it, you know. 
and he had quite something to offer. He had all the Beethoven symphonies. So that was where we started. And uh, they, they got to the point where they felt they didn't like to, they didn't like to quit for summer. They wanted to keep going. So we kept one orchestra going called the Northwest Symphony at Seattle University. And then we started another, the music camp for the kids. And we ended up with about 200 of them there. Boy, we had a good time, I'll tell you. There were lots of, lots of trails in, that, in those woods and lots of cabins where all the boys stayed in one cabin, all the girls stayed in other cabins, and two sides to each cabin. It was, it was a lot of fun. Good food and good music. Well, you can't beat that combo. And a lot of chamber music. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the Francis Walton Prize? The, the Francis Walton's composition, and they, ladies Muko, put, their, put that name on it. After I die, I'm sure that'll disappear. I hope it will. But they said that it, it was better to have a name attached, that people were more interested in it if it did. It started out with five states, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, and Alaska. Now it's up to 22 states. So it takes people who either have studied in Washington or are studying in Washington, but they can come from any part of the country, from all of those states. But if they study here, they are eligible. And they have to compete once a year, they send in tapes to a listening committee, or listening committees, I should say, a woodwind listening committee, piano listening, vocal listening committee, string listening, and they have those four categories. And the highest acknowledgement is their musicianship. Ladies Musical Club, when I first proposed this tour, of, of, of Washington, which was the first proposal. Originally, they asked me to be part of their, what they called their scholarship program. The scholarship program simply awarded money to winners of their scholarships. But that, for some reason, began to fade. People were not as interested in money. But when I proposed adding a tour, they, the first board I proposed it to in Ladies Meagles said no. I had no idea what this would entail in terms of work. I knew what work was. And I told them I did. So that the next board that came, I proposed it to them. And I have to say hello to Doreen Kinkman, to Iris Ewing, to Nola Allen, and to people like that who were a part of that board and said, let her go. Kitty Dow, let her see what she can do. And if it fades, okay. If it fails, okay. But let's at least try it. Well, I think and, one of the, yeah. for me, one of the reasons I find that prize that you started so significant is these top flight musicians then take their talent out to underserved school they districts do. so that uh, children have a chance to experience world-class music. That's right. So there is a West Coast tour, and there's a tour in between that interconnects with it, and then an East Coast tour. And I can't thank those people. On the East side of Washington enough, or the West side of Washington, a lot of them were very, very instrumental. Nico Snell up in Port Angeles, and his wife Sharon, were just instrumental in seeing that that tour kept going. And they programmed all these young people that I brought to them, and they picked winners of them for their concerts so they could play their concertos for the first time. We had two piano concertos, double piano of Mendelssohn and double piano of Poulenc. How many times do you get that to happen? Not very much. Not very often, yeah. <laughs> so things, things blossom when musicians get going, especially 
so-called amateurs because many of them are not. Well, they have worked at the best schools, but they've come back to find out they can't make a living in music. So they make their money elsewhere, put the, put the roof over the head, the bread on the table, with other jobs, but oh, they still make music. They still make music, which leads me to my next question I wanted to have you just reflect um, what you might like to say to young people today who are interested in classical music and getting involved with that. To work with them, to understand what it is. It's talking to each other with a language that you have to understand. Now technique is a part of it, but there's something else too. It's what I call, a, it isn't just the, the how many senses we possess, it's another kind of a sense where you speak to each other in musical terms and you know what someone's going to do because you see it happening, you feel it. It makes the skin rise up on my arms so, to tell you about it because it's not mystery and it's not magic, it's real. It's a sense for and a feeling for this, this magic that connects you to anyone in the world. You don't have to speak their language. You just have to play together and you understand each other. It's as simple and as complicated as that. What I admire so much and respect so much in Isaqua Philharmonic is the adventuresome spirit that is there. Those people don't take no for an answer. They simply go. I love them for it. I may be playing with them for next, may be playing with them next year, and I may not. But I'll always prize them for that spirit of adventure. Every single one of those people in the Issaquah Philharmonic has that. Well, our motto is we play for fun and friendship. Oh boy, well, it's more than that, kiddo. It's talking to each other, conversation, listening to each other. It's really remarkable. Well, I really want to thank you for taking this time to talk with me today. Oh, thank you, Sue. By golly. And I dearly hope that we will both be back in orchestra practice well. <laughs> this fall when the pandemic is hopefully over. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs>